This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, but it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dion Georgiou today to uh, the Metropolitan History Seminar. Um, Dion's just handed in his, well, a few weeks ago handed in his PhD thesis at Queen Mary, um, which is worth reading out actually for the sheer audacity of the length of the title. Um, his PhD was From the Fringe of London to the Heart of Fairyland, Suburban Community, Leisure, Voluntary Action and Density, uh, uh, Identity sorry, yeah. in the Ilford Carnival, 1905 to 1914. Uh, and he's going to be talking on an aspect of this drawn from the PhD and expanded for us today. Um, only a local affair, imagining and enacting locality through London's Boer War carnivals. Uh, thank you very much, Dion. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, this was something that um, was... It started off as... It was the, the kind of Boer War carnivals were the first um, London carnivals that I looked at um, in my PhD. Uh, and it was actually what the subject of my upgrade chapter, which promptly um, was then chopped from the PhD. And... And turned, which then became kind of much more sort of a micro history, looking at one particular carnival in Ilford. Um, but I've, I was quite happy with the up. It wasn't a reflection on the, on what I thought of the uh, of the subject or the or, or my work on it. And um, and now that I have finished the PhD, I'm revisiting it and hoping to turn it into a couple of articles. So I presented um, a paper based on the kind of national and imperial identities um, side of things last week at the War Culture and Society seminar. But this is looking much more at the sort of um, at the at the Equally important, I think, issues of um, of locality in the carnival and and the and the role of local politics um, in in reaction to what was you know a celebration of an or a celebration of a charitable initiative as well to um, in relation to imperial affairs. So um, I'll get uh, I'll get started then. So uh, so this paper examines how locality was conceptualised and performed in Greater London through a series of torchlight processions of costumed individuals and decorated vehicles often dubbed carnivals, held in the city and its suburbs in 1900 to raise funds for war related charities, particularly the Daily Mail Telegraph's Fund for Combatants, Widows and Orphans. I will firstly outline the proliferation of these carnivals and provide a brief overview of, the, of their organisers' social composition and the broader array of organisations participating in the processions and connected fundraising efforts. Subsequently, I consider how the carnival spread across the capital related to communication networks, principally the local press and the telegraph, which facilitated the conceptualisation and performance of both locality and metropolis as holistic entities. The penultimate section considers expressions of local identity in and around the carnival and how these were related to newly established administrative boundaries and overlapping and conflicting senses of locality rooted in nomenclature, community life and physical geography. Finally, I will discuss nested class identities bound up with ideas of locality, evidence in selection of procession routes, organisational participation in carnivals and particular local rivalries. Drawing predominantly on local press reports as well as printed ephemera and census data, as well as the Daily Telegraph itself, the article focuses on five case studies. The East End Carnival, held in the predominantly working class parishes that would come to form the metropolitan boroughs of Stepney and Bethnal Green, the Greenwich, Deptford and Charlton Carnival, which represented the more socially mixed area in the southeast of the city, the St Pancras Carnival in a more affluent part of North London, the Hornsey Carnival in a middle-class Middlesex suburb, and the Wilsden Carnival in a more proletarian Middlesex suburb. A number of existing studies have illustrated how locality remained integral to life in Britain despite the increasing nationalisation of politics, economic society and culture over the course of the 19th century. Miles Ogborn, for example, rejected a zero-sum interpretation of central local power relations within the Victorian British state, and instead emphasised that levels of state apparatus were interdependent, specific outcomes resulted from individual processes of negotiation between them, and the relationship remained dynamic within the operation of policy. Philip Harling, meanwhile, has highlighted how a number of key developments of, of late Victorian and, and Edwardian politics were pioneered at the local level, including tackling diseases, experiments in municipalisation, and female and working class participation in government. KDM Snell has also st stressed the centrality of the parish during this period, highlighting its significance to a range of, of social aspects, from welfare provision to marriage patterns. My research is intended to contribute to this body of work, but this demonstrated the continued importance of locality as a source of identity and basis for voluntary action within the context of late Victorian London, particularly in relation to the city's suburban expansion, 
the reform of its local government and its centrality to nation and empire. It also demonstrates the fluidity of locality at this time, which did not simply exist a priori, but rather was consistently being reimagined and remanifested in relation to the context I just listed, with a range of competing and overlapping geographies of varying subnational scales vying for people's attachment and engagement. Charity carnivals of varying types had already become a feature of London life during the final decade of the 19th century. Following on from this, the first Boer War carnival to be held in London took place in the South East London suburb of Lewisham on the 17th of 8th and 18th of January 1900. Arrangements for this event were put into place during a particularly difficult period of the war, with Britain suffering reverses at Mag Magusfontein, Stormberg and Colenso in December. Carnivals then started to take place in other suburbs in or around South London, Brixton and Penge and Annerley in March, Horton Kirby near Dartford in April, and Greenwich, Deptford and Charlton and Gravesend in May. British fortunes in South Africa were by this stage taking a turn for the better. Ladysmith and Kimberley, besieged by the Boers since the previous autumn, were finally relieved in February, and on the 16th of May, Maffey King was also relieved, prompting huge celebrations back in London, while Pretoria fell to British forces on 5th of June. It was against this backdrop of British successes that the carnival movement spread north of the Thames and proliferated across the capital and its suburbs from late May through to early July. This trend subsequently petered out, although a procession was held in St George's and Westminster as late as November. While most of these carnivals were held to raise money for the Telegraphs Fund, and that's the, the ones that you can see listed on this, uh, on this page, were all related to the Telegraph Fund, there were some partial and full exceptions to this trend. So, for example, portions of the receipts from the Bermondsey and Hornsey carnivals were donated to local funds for soldiers and sailors' families, while the annual carnival held in Tottenham since 1898 in aid of the local hospital had its remit extended in 1900 to raise funds for war charities, local war charities as well. The movements usually commenced with a number of influential citizens organising public meetings at which committees were elected to organise a carnival. The most detailed information available regarding membership of these committees comes from Greenwich, Deptford and Charlton. Here local businessmen, particular, particularly licensed victuallers and retailers, were the most prominent members of the carnival's administration, while there were also a number of professional men such as doctors, solicitors, accountants and journalists involved. However, the lower echelons of the committee system also included a, a substantial number of working men. Information available about other carnivals administrations suggests they too were dominated by local businessmen and to a lesser extent professionals. Carnival movements tended to have their basis in the district's existing institutions, in some cases springing from one specific organisation. The Lewisham Carnival was first mooted in the Catford Conservative Club, with a number of its members subsequently becoming district secretaries within the movement. The idea of holding a carnival in Battersea similarly germinated in the Bolingbroke Tradesmen's Association. While local friendly societies were, as shall, we explain, as, as shall be explained a little later on, instrumental in initiating the Hornsey Carnival movement. Elsewhere, activists seeking to organise a carnival frequently invited local organisations to send representatives to be elected to the initial general committees. Among those present at the, present at the Greenwich, Deptford and Charlton Carnival's first public meetings were the chairman of Greenwich Conservative Club and the East Greenwich Traders Association while Greenwich and trade, Deptford's trade unions and friendly and benevolent societies were also invited to send delegates. Representatives of the Railway Service, Railway Servants Amalgamated Society were similarly present at the first public meeting of the Wilsden Carnival movement. Local government officials also played a key role in the administration of many carnivals. Edward Sinclair Cox, chairman of the St Pancras Carnival's Central Executive Committee, was also chairman of the St Pancras Vestry, while the committee's secretary, C.H.F. Barrett, and his assistant, Henry T. Richards, were also vestrymen. The Hornsey Carnival's executive committee, meanwhile, was chaired by W.P. Wood of Middlesex County Council, while each of the district committees included representatives from Hornsey Urban District Council. Wilson Urban District Council was similarly represented in the Wilson Carnival's district committees. The East End Carnival also included London County Council member B.S. Strauss among its officials, while both the Lewisham and Brixton Carnivals were chaired by local LCC members. The carnival movements more broadly were heavily reliant on local businesses both as, both as contributors to the funds and as arrangers of procession items. Licensed victuallers were again particularly active as fundraisers and donors, as well as in providing spaces for public and committee meetings. Theatre proprietors were also able to draw upon a supply of props, costumes and players for allegorical decorated vehicles, as well as using their venues to hold supplementary entertainments to swell takings from the processions. Other important participants in the procession included Friendly societies, temperance societies, trade unions, sports clubs, 
political clubs, bands, voluntary army battalions and branches of youth organisations like the Church Flags Brigade and the Boys Brigade. Political clubs, churches, schools and local government buildings also served as sites for public meetings and subsequently as committee headquarters. Numerous advancements in communications from the late 18th century onwards facilitated great integration of Britain as a nation, with travel across Britain accelerated firstly by the rollout of new turnpikes and canals, and then by the spread of railways. Victorians also saw telegraphy as annihilating time and space and making Britain and the wider world smaller. While following the mid-19th century repeal of taxes on newspaper publishing, a mass readership press emerged in Britain, with titles and sales proliferating. In the wake of these developments, governance also became increasingly national as the central state, despite its laissez-faire inclinations, incrementally intervened in a range of areas while political campaigning networks became broader and participation in selecting national government wider. The 19th century also saw drastic increases in the size of London's population and the extent of its diffusion. By 1901, the county of London's population had surpassed 4.5 million, close to five times the number of people who had lived in that same area in 1801 while more than 2 million more resided in the more newly built up districts beyond the county borders designated as London's Outer Ring, which was more than six times the size of the population of that same area 50 years earlier. Yet London nonetheless maintained and enhanced its cohesion as a single entity in a number of ways over the course of the 19th century. A number of bodies were tasked with aspects of metropolitan governance during this period, with the establishment in 1855 of the Metropolitan Board of Works, later, represent, later replaced with the directly elected London County Council, in 1889. Economically, London had numerous districts with local concentration of particular sectors, which served the capital as a whole and beyond, yet they could recruit staff living across London and its suburbs, due to the city's increasingly extensive transport network, augmented by new railway lines and stations, and improvements to existing services, as well as later to the rollout of electric tram, trams and motor buses. Nonetheless, these processes of nationalisation and metropolitan metropolitanisation were not tantamount to delocalisation. Technological advancements that made communications and organisation at a national and transnational scale possible could also be utilised in ways that buttressed or redefined rather than diminished local fields of activity, something particularly pertinent to studying the suburb. For example, Michael Harris has found that 350 new newspaper titles emerged in Greater London during the 1880s and 1890s alone including a number of suburban weeklies that sold around 4,000 to 5,000 copies per issue. Moreover, as Patricia Gartside has noted, even the national press frequently afforded extended coverage to local and suburban goings-on within London, as commercial pressures forced papers to become progressively more London-centric in both their distribution and coverage. Another valuable example of how new technologies could remake and reinforce locality is electric tram. Alan A. Jackson listed 105 separate tram services introduced by the LCC local councils and private operators in suburban London between 1901 and 1914. These were shorter haul than rail routes and facilitated inter-suburban and intra-suburban commuting. Now the Boer War carnivals provide a valuable insight into this multiscalarity as national involvement in an imperial war animated local networks of communication and activity in succession around the capital. Local newspapers for example played an important part in fostering carnival movements they championed the Telegraph Fund and spoke the language of patriotism but were just as willing to appeal to local pride and self-interest, namely the presence within the districts of combatants' families. They also provided a means for carnival organisers to communicate with their wider local community and furnished details of public meetings, donations and related fundraising efforts, as well as detailed reports of the processions themselves. The Kentish Mercury, for example, covered affairs in Greenwich, Deptford and Lewisham from, and from late 1899 onwards reported on local war charity fundraising efforts in these areas, including the build-up to the Lewisham Carnival. Its editor, G. Willis, then became treasurer for the Greenwich, Deptford and Charlton Carnival, his newspaper thereafter effectively becoming a mouthpiece for the carnival's organisers, frequently extolling the virtues of the Daily Telegraph Fund and each week publishing the names of those who contributed to the local carnival fund. Even after the procession had been held and the various organising committees had ceased meeting regularly, the Mercury continued to report any contributions to the fund and to call on others to donate. By familiarising their readers with the activities of the numerous existing interpersonal and interorganisational networks that supported the carnival, the local press thus constructed the facade of a broader, more unified local public sphere from the complex, fragmented lived experience of community life. Yet the Daily Telegraph itself played an even more integral role in stimulating this local activism. 
Um, to quote Patricia Garside again, the Telegraph appealed particularly to London's trademen and clerks, the lower middle class backbone of the carnival movement. And that as well as... Um, and uh, this was reflected in... Um, in its coverage of the Boer War Carnival's phenomenon and who, it respond, and who responded to it. So following its establishment of the Widows and Orphans Fund in late 1899, the newspaper dedicated substantial space within its pages to describing the various money-raising efforts being made around Britain on its behalf. On the 20th of December 1899, 1899, it reported for the first time on the nascent Lewisham Carnival movement. Henceforth, its coverage of the London Carnivals became increasingly extensive. This reportage was similar in content to that of the local papers, with carnival organisers even frequently writing into the Telegraph to invite assistance from and supply information to their own local communities, as well as to relay their district's meet, uh, achievements to the paper's wider readership. The penetration of London's growing suburbs by a national means of communication with a national objective paradoxically made it an effective tool for maintaining local cohesion and interaction in the face of potentially destabilising rapid movements of population. The relationship between locality and nation was also evident in the processions themselves. These were unsurprisingly dominated by national and imperial themes, with representations of soldiers particularly common, while depictions of leading generals and the royal family, model armoured trains and battleships, and personifications of Britain and Empire also featured frequently. Yet local themes and variations were far from absent from the carnivals. The East End Carnival, for example, included cars representative of a local public house, Spitalfields We've contributed by the local public house. Uh, Spitalfields weavers at a loom, East End children at play, and the Fairlock boat, a reference to the East End tradition of taking boats on wheels up to Fairlock Fair in Essex. While the Wilsden Carnival included a rep car representative of Old Wilsden. These national and local reference points did not merely coexist. Some carnival items sought to locate their district within a wider national story. The Wilson procession included a car representative of Kingsbury cum Neeson volunteers of 1802 and a carriage carrying Neeson military and naval heroes. Public discussions of the carnivals were also notable for the connections made between locality and country. In its report on the East End Carnival, the East London advertiser insisted that no one who is familiar with the East End could ever have any doubts as to the loyalty and patriotism of the people in that district. The Finchley Press, meanwhile, was incensed when the Great Northern Railway reportedly refused to run special, a special train to Finchley on the day of its carnival as the event was only a local affair, which prompted the paper to, to declare that the company's patriotism is worse than its train service. <laughs> <laughs> the national-local relationship also related to a third dimension in the spreading of the carnivals, that of London as an incubator for these movements. While the timing of their proliferation coheres closely with the unfolding of events in South Africa, the geographic pattern of their distribution seems rooted in factors far closer to home. The announcement of plans to hold a carnival in one district frequently preceded the development of similar movements in neighbouring areas. So this is evident from the way Lewisham's example was subsequently followed by other parts of South London and suburban Kent. While there were also discernible patterns of dissemination thereafter in other areas of Greater London. So you can just see there how the carnivals kind of how they how they spread. Um, in that particular area over the first couple of months that the carnivals were going on for. And then here you can see um, the way that carnivals were held in several Essex suburbs during May alone. So that was the kind of spread of carnivals mm. in May. Lineages such as this would appear to demonstrate the importance of more local means of information dispersion, such as personal connections with neighbouring towns or local newspapers whose circulation might include more than one district hosting a carnival, as in the aforementioned case of the Kentish Mercury. While the, East London Carn while the East London advertiser similarly covered the parishes that put on the East End and the Bromley Bow and Poplar carnivals, there were also numerous instances of local newspapers printing reports of carnivals in neighbouring districts. They point to the existence of, broad existence of broader regions within London, encompassing several administratively distinct districts. Yet the spread of carnivals was not solely over short proximities. With its initial expansion into suburban east, north and west, later west London, this trend became far more city-wide and physical distances between carnival-holding districts and their imitators lengthened significantly. 
So you can see there from the way that it's that you can often see one area holding a carnival and then another area copying its example. But at the same time, you might see carnivals that you start to see carnivals taking place on opposite ends of London at, at similar times, highlighting the way that kind of like it's gone from being about local connections to being far more metropolitan, citywide connections. It's not necessarily just about geographic proximity anymore. Now, the Telegraph played a central role in this process by transmitting information about local carnivals more widely and identifying them as a primarily metropolitan and in particular a suburban phenomenon. On the 13th of April, it printed an article on the topic in which it claimed that London's hugeness had meant the great pageants which have given rise to the most crowded and animated scenes ever known in the suburbs have passed with as little attention from outside as if Brixton and Penns were separated by Babylonian walls from the life of the capital at large. It also noted that the great brothers of the north are astir, and predicted that, with the rival achievements of the rival side of the river before them, they will not willingly allow themselves to be surpassed. It therefore reiterated tropes about the sprawling ca capital's fragmentation on the one hand, while recognising its increasing integration on the other. When it spread the word about local carnivals, it made them more likely that they would draw crowds from elsewhere. In the case of the Lewisham and Finchley carnivals, it even provided detailed advice on how to travel to these places from central London, and thereby that visitors would be inspired to hold carnivals in their own districts. The Telegraph thus helped reconstruct the reconstitute the city as a single entity. Its carnival, its reports on carnivals repeatedly referred to suburban or to suburbia or suburban London, constructing this as a unified less geographically specific place. In doing so, it reinforced these various districts' awareness of their own growing interconnectedness with the metropolis. Though located some distance away across the Thames, Brixton was a constant reference point within the St Pancras Carnival movement, while further north, in Wilson and in Haringey, mention was also made of the example set by the Southern Parishes, as Wilson organized, Wilson's organising secretary, Henry Plomer, put it. Local government in Greater London was significantly transformed during the Victorian period. Under the 1894 Local Government Act, vestries, which undertook the governance of civil parishes, were abolished outside the County of London, and new urban and rural districts with their own councils established instead, supplanting often geographically coterminous sanitary districts and coexisting alongside the early, est early established municipal boroughs. Sorry, no. Um, yes, municipal boroughs. Um, so many different local government terms to remember. <laughs> Uh, by 1911, there were 71 urban districts and municipal boroughs and 30 rural districts wholly or partially within the Outer Ring area. Within the County of London itself, the London Government Act of 1899 dictated that the 41 parish vestries and district boards of works existent within the County of London repl be replaced by 28 new metropolitan boroughs, with their first elections to their councils scheduled to take place in November 1900. The vestries who administered these parishes had already been undertaking increasing volumes of municipal projects since the 1880s, and by the late 1890s a large number of them did support incorporation for largely honorific purposes, along with a limited transfer of powers from the LCC. With this reorganisation in the offing, many organisers and commentators on Boer War-related carnivals within the County of London felt a successfully organised event boded well for a, newspaper, for a new borough's future life and administration. This was particularly the case in those new districts being formed from the amalgamation of several parishes. When moving that a carnival be held in the area soon to become the Metropolitan Borough of Stepney, London County Councillor W.C. Johnson noted that this would be the first opportunity the new borough of Stepney would have of showing its unity and he trusted would make, they would make the carnival the best in London. The South London Press interpreted, interpreted the success of the carnival in the area to be covered by the new borough of Bermondsey in a similar light. This partly reflected the integral relationship carnival movements had with organs of local government and local representatives of wider government bodies. Their valuable, multifaceted support served as an ideological purpose, helping to firmly associate the carnivals with their localities through these connections with their district's most prominent public figures and spaces. Noting in his Hornsey car Journal car column that the Islington Vestry Clerk had been in invited to serve as Honorary Secretary for that parish's carnival, Phoenix, a uh, columnist in the, in the journal, claimed that this would give the event a, sem a semi-official character. Administrative boundaries could thus shape conceptual parameters of the district and reinforce local identities. Nonetheless, 
There was also simultaneously considerable autonomy among the smaller districts within areas covered by individual carnivals. This was reflected in the predominant carnival organisation structure, composed of committees usually based on wards within the district and a central executive featuring ward officials, or district officials, <coughs> which often signified a central decent decentralisation of power. In St Pancras, when Chairman so Cox Sinclair was asked about the issue of cars being duplicated, he replied that the various committees will have their own ideas as to the sort of show they will make. We cannot, you see, dictate to our good friends. In some cases, carnivals were even held by single wards within larger parishes or urban districts, such as by Brixton in Lambeth or Canning Town in, the, in West Ham. The malleability and multiplicity of local identities within the capital was also evident from the way individual carnivals were often given complex, ty complex titles that fluctuated during the course of the preparations. The Camberwell, Peckham and Dulwich and the Bromley, Bow and Poplar carnivals, for example, covered the areas of the parishes soon to be metropolitan boroughs of Camberwell and Poplar respectively, yet their lengthier monikers reflected a desire to stress the parts played by individual areas within these districts. Elsewhere, the Bayswater, Paddington and North Kensington Carnival and the subsequent South Kensington, Brompton and Knightsbridge and Mayfair Carnival both cross administrative boundaries. Meanwhile, residents of Blackheath decided to hold their own carnival in late June in tandem with the parish of, Ca Child the parishes, uh, the parish of Charlton and Kidbrook, having felt unable to participate more fully in the recent Greenwich, Deptford and Charlton Carnival. This reflected Blackheath's somewhat liminal and interdependent status. Independent status. It was located on the boundary between the parishes of Greenwich, Charlton and Kidbrook, Lewisham and Lee, and had over the course of the previous century developed its own strong associational culture and institutions. The flip side of this capacity for independent local action was a parochial street that meant relations within carnival movements could at times be fractious. The procession route, perceived as a mapping of the most significant streets in the area, was a particularly common cause of contention. In the case of the Camberwell, Peckham and Dulwich Carnival, a deputation of Dulwich residents arrived at a committee meeting to demand several more Dulwich streets be included. There was similar dis disgruntlement expressed in the build-up to the Bayswater, Paddington and North Kensington Carnival, and to a lesser extent prior to the St Pancras procession. Yet perhaps the most acrimonious dispute over any carnival route was that between the Muswell Hill and Stroud, and Stroud Green wards of Hornsey. In June, a proposal that the Muswell Hill section of the route be shortened met with hostility from, the wards, from that ward's committee, which wrote to the Hornsey executive to present, protest that the shopkeepers and residents of Muswell Hill had contributed considerably to the carnival in the belief it would pass through their district. As a result, the carnival route was not only amend, was not amended, but its resulting lengthiness meant that the procession did not reach Stroud Green until extremely late in the evening, with many districts contingents in the parade having by that stage dropped out. This resulted in a war of words via the Hornsey Journal's letters page between the chairman of the Stroud Green and Finsbury Park District Committee, District Councillor William J. Fox, the Hornsey Executive Committee Chairman W.P. Wood, and the Muswell Hill Chairman H.S. Chamberlain, who, who, like Fox, was also a district councillor. On two instances, the existence of overlapping localities and alternative local identities resulted in rifts within carnival movements that led to them splitting in two. In the case of the Wilsden Carnival, the ward committee formed in Kilburn, which had materialised later than committees set up in other parts of the district, asked for the event to be postponed. Sorry, asked for the event to be postponed to a later date, and when this request was rejected, resolved to leave the Wilsden movement and establish its own carnival in tandem with the neighbouring districts of Hampstead and Cricklewood. This decision caused significant rancour, played out in the letters page of the Wilsden Chronicle and subsequently in a meeting of Wilson District Council, in which C.C. Pinkham, a Kensal Rise councillor and a member of, Wils of the Wilson Carnival's organising body, rowed over the matter with Jay Savey, a Kilburn councillor. The sluggishness with which the Kil Wilson Carnival movement spread does suggest some lack of cohesion between the different areas of Wilson. Um, and just to kind of, to kind of highlight this, um, I mean, if you look at the map, I mean, this is Wilson here, so you can see that the different areas are actually quite disparate and separated mm -hmm. still by fields. Um, this is the sort of Kilburn area there. So again, you can see it's quite, it's quite uh, separate again from the rest of Wilsden and much, kind of, much more integrated into London's built up area. 
Within Kilburn, identification with Wills and Urban District was problematised by the fact part of Kilburn lay over its border in the London parish of Hampstead. This meant that local allegiances were fluid enough to be switched over to Hampstead when the Kilburn wing of the Wills and Carnival movement became dissatisfied. Yet this was not an entirely happy marriage either. At an early meeting of the nascent movement, there was vigorous debate over whether the event should be called the Kilburn, Hampstead and Cricklewood Carnival or the Hampstead, Kilburn and Cricklewood Carnival. <laughs> prompting the meeting's chairman to remark that poor Kilburn was, and always had been, on crutches. The capacity of the carnival movements to reflect and exacerbate local antagonisms was further demonstrated in Hornsey. Separate carnival movements had initially spread up in Hornsey and in Haringey, which again extended over Hornsey's border into the neighbouring urban district of Tottenham, before they took the decision to merge, and then to invite Wood Green to join the fold. However, when the movement fragmented, the Haringey wards remained affiliated with Wood Green, with the remainder of Hornsey holding its own carnival. This highlighted Haringey's marginal position in relation to the rest of Hornsey, from which it was separated by the Great Northern Railway Line that ran through the district, and thereby hampered relations between the two sections, which were only linked by a single road bridge. So you can see uh, the railway line here as it's going through the the district and you can see that this is Haringey so you can see how it's really cut off by um, by the railway line from the rest of Hornsey. The Hornsey executive wrote to the Haringey Hornsey and Wood Green Carnival's organisers to request that they keep their procession to the east of the railway line with the Hornsey Carnival keeping to the west and although this was not acceded to it highlights the capacity of the built environment to offer alternative more tangible borders to administrative ones around which local identities could be formed. Similarly, it's quite possible that Greenwich Park, which uh, is there on the map, um, played a similar role in dividing Blackheath from the rest of Greenwich and thereby helping to foster an independent sense of identity that manifested in the area holding its own carnival. Distance was indeed cited by its residents as one of the reasons they could not play a greater part in the Greenwich Deptford and Charlton carnival. Our historians have come to see assertions of class identity as deeply bound up with particular, with particular spaces and contests over their boundaries, ownership and meanings. For example, Kate Hill's work has demonstrated how during the 19th century, the established middle classes sought to maintain control over Britain's urban, civic and cultural spaces, such as local government buildings, museums and galleries, but found their dominance increasingly challenged by both the lower middle and working classes. Richard Dennis has also highlighted unease over the presence of some social groups, such as costermongers, in London's public spaces during the 19th and early 20th centuries, as well as how the working classes frequently took control over prominent official and retail locations, such as Trafalgar Square and the West End, during political protests over this period. Class and occupational groups utilised a range of strategies to legitimise their entrance to or control over urban spaces, or to manifest their status within them. These could involve reshaping the built environment, as with the clearance of slum districts and erection of new landmark civic and commercial buildings, or the formation of public or voluntary organisations designed to give particular groups the ability to police, or at least gain a stake in, the control of urban space. Other strategies comprise performances intended to communicate social position to onlookers within the expanding and rapidly changing urban environment. One of these was the procession itself which underwent a revival in its popularity during the 19th century in cities across Britain, its, its dominions and indeed other countries. In this context, it offered the visualisation of urban social order at a time when familiar existing social structures and the relations binding them together were being displaced by forces such as economic change and migration. Now, The Ballwall Carnivals constituted a similar attempt by London's middle and lower middle classes to define their localities and, the public, and their public spaces in their own image not least in their selection of carnival routes. I analysed the social compositions of the routes of the Greenwich, Deptford and Charlton, the St Pancras and the East End carnivals, based on the thematic maps of these districts compiled by Charles Booth and his team of social researchers. These routes were not socially homogenous because different classes often resided within relatively close proximity to each other. Nonetheless, the share of streets in the procession perceived as being middle class in their makeup significantly exceeded the percentages that this social group made up of their local population more widely. This underlines the extent to which carnival organisers identified the principal streets embodying their districts as those which mirrored their own social composition, even within the predominantly working class East End. The selection of carnival routes can be read as standardising linear narrativization of a district's complex matrix of public spaces 
against the backdrop of inflows and outflows of migrants and accompanying fluctuations in social tone. Yet, as illustrated earlier, the local middle classes were more than willing to, comport, to court the support of respectable working class organisations like trade unions representing skilled workers and friendly societies whose members were involved in both the organisation of the carnivals and paraded in the processions themselves. This would appear to imply significant support among these groups for the carnival's patriotic and altruistic rationales. Yet participating in the shared carnival culture of the carnivals <coughs> could additionally have provided the means by which they could stake a place within their own local public spheres. There are certainly elements of this in the nature of trade union and friendly society participation in the processions. Rather than sending themed cars, these organisations tended instead to send contingents to march with their banners and, in the case of friendly societies, regalia. Attaining respectability had been a central focus of friendly society since the mid-19th century. As Daniel Weinbrin has argued, the carrying of banners suggested that friendly societies could be trusted in public spaces and signified sturdy, educated, orderly working class men. For friendly societies and unions, parading in these carnivals was an expression of a fused working class and local identity, demonstrating their loyalty to the local and national community and emblemising their status as an important and legitimate component of both. Moreover, representatives of poorer districts also frequently expressed an assertive local identity that stressed the working class nature of their locality, even though they were usually not working class themselves. When members of the Euston Road District Committee sought to present an £8 account uh, to the Executive Committee for the cost of securing a ban for their contingent, they faced fierce opposition op Position from all of, from officials from Southern and from sorry, they faced. Let me have a, have a drink of water. It's a tongue twister. They faced fierce opposition from officials from Summerstown, who stated that as the poorest area in the district, they had forgone having a band. Similarly, in Wilsden, the Church End Committee came in for severe reproachment for reporting a loss. Its most ardent critic was our, our friend the Councillor Pinkham of the Kensal Rise Committee again, who compared Church End's record unfavourably with that of his own district and of Wilson Green, both of which he described as working class areas. And in the case of the East End Carnival movement, MP H.S. Samuel told the meeting in his Limehouse constituency that the people of the East End had done far more than their richer brethren in the West End in the cause of charity, tapping into local perceptions of West Londoners as selfish and patronising in their attitudes to East London. Meanwhile, the split in the Hornsey Haringey and Wood Green Carnival movement occurred amid accusations that local friendly societies had been prevented from electing representatives onto its organising committee. The friendly society subsequently formed an integral part of the re-established carnival movement covering the Hornsey area, barring Haringey. With 75% of the proceeds from this event to go to the Telegraphs Fund and the remaining funds to support the friendly society's own efforts to assist combatants' dependents in the district. A dispute then arose over the status of the Stroud Green and Finsbury Park wards. The Haringey, Hornsey and Wood Green Carnival organisers held a stormy meeting there on the 7th of June, at which Councillor Fox of, um, of the Stroud Green Committee accused them of having ignored Stroud Green and Finsbury Park up until that point and warned them against seeking to form a ward committee for the carnival in that area now. When the Haringey Carnival Secretary A.T. Green ridiculed the idea that they as amateurs could distribute the money as effectively as so great an organisation as possessed by the Telegraph, Fox retorted that the friendly societies, whose philanthropic work was so greatly appreciated, could not be placed in so lowly a bracket. The Hornsey Haringey schism, therefore, was closely related to attitudes to class and, and to localism itself. Those who supported the friendly society's right to a large portion of the carnival's takings were defending the capacity of locally based working class institutions to match a more nationally coordinated approach to welfare provision. The nuances of class may also help to explain Blackheath's collaboration with its neighbouring districts in putting on a carnival of their own. According to Booth's maps, a large proportion of streets in these areas were categorised as wealthy, whereas the streets where most of the Greenwich Committee members resided were ranked as fairly comfortable or well-to-do. Aspirations over social status also informed the sense of local identity shared by residents of Haringey on both sides of the Hornsey-Tottenham border. At that side, residents of the Tottenham portion of Haringey were actually agitated to join, to join Hornsey as they resented being part of the otherwise largely working class wards of St Anne's and West Green, and were only placated the following year when a separate Haringey ward was created in Tottenham. This again reflects the role of class in the complex process of place formation, especially in the burgeoning suburbs. 
local identities expressed in the Boerwall carnivals therefore arose partly in relation to the spatial distribution of different social groups, as well as being shaped by how individual carnivals, largely middle and lower middle class organisation organisers, related to other social classes dwelling in close proximity to them. In concluding then, studying London's Boerwall carnivals offers an opportunity to deconstruct the local within the context of the city at that point in time, to emphasise its complexity, fluidity and performative nature. <coughs> there have been a number of different sets of parameters for sub-metropolitan collective activity, whether this was bounded by administrative borders, place nomenclature, physical geography or social class. These localities were rooted in pre-existing communications networks and institutions, but identification with them was also contingent and could fray or even fragment and be superseded by other conceptualisations of locality, as occurred in the cases of Wilson and Hornsey, Wilson and the, Harringay, and the Hornsey Harringay and Wood Green Carnivals. Locality was thus destabilised and reformed through the interface between ideas and action and between itself and other geographic scales of activity. Metropolitan national institutions generated new ideas of the local, arising from their own responses to existing conceptions and projections of local place within the capital, whether that be the local government acts that created the metropolitan boroughs in the county of London and the urban districts just beyond, and the, uh, yeah, and the urban districts are just beyond, or the Daily Telegraph with its talk of the suburbs. The local also persisted because it offered the scale at which London's lower middle classes and skilled working classes could, through voluntary action, assert their own agency and accrue institutional social capital not as readily, not as readily available within social relations and organisational activity conducted over a wider geographical scope, albeit, albeit still, while still working in tandem with national institutions like the Telegraph. Wrangles over the allocation of funding, particularly in the case of Hornsey, Harringay and Wood Green, betrayed this tension between supporting the Telegraph's initiative and taking responsibility for distributing aid into the remit of the local community, as manifested in the guise of the Carnival Organising Body and its associated institutions. Thank you.